You're listening to Under the Shell Podcast, the best in America. Welcome to Under the Shell, presented by Testudo Times. I'm Brenner Weissel. Sam Jane. And Michael House. And for the first time in a few seasons, we welcome on a former football player. Bruce Perry, take it away. Our next guest we're pleased to have on is Bruce Perry, a former Maryland running back, 2002 ACC Offensive Player of the Year, and a former uh, player of Mike Loxley. Bruce, thanks so much for joining us. We appreciate your time. No problem. I think a lot of time, a lot of people forget I'm the last Doak Walker finalist that Maryland has ever had. There you go. You add one more credential to his long list of it, and we can kind of start there, Bruce. Take us through, um, you know, when you when you had that season in 2002. Now that you're, you know, not to say it's been a couple of years since that no, happened. Go, go but... ahead and say I'm old. It's all right. <laughs> <laughs> um, what's like the biggest thing you look back on? Is it a particular moment? Is it like because, you know, athletes, they talk about kind of getting in that like almost flow state of like throughout a season where everything is just you get a routine and you're you're just in it. Is there anything that stands out to you that you remember specifically? It's funny that you asked me that question because another one of our Turks, Jafar Williams, is uh, currently down there in Vanderbilt uh, handling receivers. And uh, we were just having a conversation and I would tell him, man, I miss the grind. I miss, you know, watching film studying my opponent, um, getting great game game plans and going out and executing. I miss being around the guys, you know, day in and de- day out, working for a common goal. Um, and then, you know, performing on Saturday, man, you know, it's nothing like hearing the roar, which used to be Bird Stadium. It's nothing like hearing those, those people chanting your name and you going out and performing for the masses. So, you know, as a whole, you know, I miss the entire process. And more importantly, I miss, the, I miss the guys. I miss being in that locker room. Like we had a special bond that we have until this day. Um, and that never goes away. Once a turf, always a turf. You know, Bruce, at your time at Maryland, you, you faced some injuries, struggled with some injuries there. But your sophomore year, Maryland fans really got to get a glimpse at who you really are as a rusher. Rushed for over 1,200 yards. Looking back now, do you have any doubt that you would have gotten that all-time rushing record if injuries hadn't gotten in the way? Oh, no question about it. I think, um, you know, Ralph Regan and I talk, you know, often, you know, and one of the things that he wrote in his book and one of the things that he preaches to this day is, you know, had we been able to keep me healthy, it's no doubt in his mind that I that I would have had that rushing record and not only that, been been considered probably – the greatest back in Maryland history. I think what I was able to provide is versatility. Um, 2001, I was second leading receiver. I had almost 600 yards receiving on top of 1,200 yards rushing. I think I might have finished about sixth or eighth in um, total yardage that year. Um, so without a doubt, you know, if we would have been able to do that, you know, I would have definitely – that, that that record would have had my I had my sights on it, but make no mistake, I spent two years behind Lamont Jordan. I know the greatness that he had. Um, I know what he was able to accomplish because I was actually there. I watched him rush for 307 yards against Virginia. I had 47 yards myself in that game, so you know I'm in great company. Take me through as we you know think back to the early 2000s in College Park, what was life kind of like? What, what was the life of a, a football player playing at Maryland in, in, in those days? Um, <laughs> completely different. <laughs> completely different. You got to understand during those times, we weren't, we were known for being bas- a basketball school. We weren't winning on the football field. Um, and so, you know, we weren't the most popular guys on campus. You know, you know, winning brings all that. You know, it brings the notoriety. It brings the attention. We weren't winning at the time. And Ralph Regan came into a program that was rich in talent. I think um, Mike Loxley was the recruiting coordinator at the time. Um, he and Ron Vanderm Linden did a, did a great job of assembling talent. Um, I think where we fell short during the Vanderlyn and errors is that we did not know how not to lose. We weren't taught how not to lose. Um, we, we did not um, focus meticulously on the little things. 
And when Ralph came into our lives and into the program, he he instilled um, he instilled just day in and day out, punching the clock, grinding the clock, knowing what it what it felt like to actually put in the work to go out and win, you know, and um, and it paid dividends. It paid dividends from the start and, and guys bought in guys bought into the program, bought into the concept. And we were able to get things rolling early. You know, you talked about some of the kind of notoriety that comes with winning. Um, and then, you know, on the offset, I think there's some frustration that comes with losing. And that's kind of what Maryland football's, you know, been doing this year. It's been a tough start to the season, dropping another game. And, you know, probably the worst, one of the worst losses uh, since Loxley's taken over. As an alum, what are you, what were you thinking watching the game on Saturday? Um. You know, I, I have to, I got to speak very, very, um, I have to put on some, some gloves and speak with kid gloves because I, I, um, it's personal to me, you know, because I understand what it takes with, with these kids, um, these young men are putting into the game. I think, um, honestly speaking, what I'm looking for is the fight. I'm looking to see guys fight. I'm looking to see guys compete. I'm looking to see guys not um, not willing to accept um, defeat down to the last whistle. And, you know, it just seems to me like, you know, it was just – it was deflating. It was deflating for us to see because we know these guys have talent. We know they're better than, than what we're seeing. But we also have to take into account, you know, situational football and the things that are going on during the game take those into into account but you know as viewers of it, it it's it's not the easiest thing to watch yeah and um i think a lot you know th- this season has brought out a lot of frustration um with coach loxley and and um kind of the the struggles i think he's had as a coach this year what what's your message to fans i know you guys are really close but just in your honest opinion as a football watcher and football former player um What's your thoughts on his coaching this season, and and why, how do you think he's going to kind of pull them out? Yeah, um, it's very disheartening when when you've got a team that's that's trying to fight and the support isn't there, when the fan when the stands are you know somewhat empty just because it's not you know a marquee USC Michigan type of game, you know fan, we've got to understand that our guys need support whether we're playing you know, the school of the blind or whether we're playing Alabama. You know what I mean? That's number one. Number two, like I said, in the NIL era, um, some of these Big Ten schools have a very large cupboard and a very large cachet to be able to not only go out and acquire um, great talent and great players, but also keep the players that they have in-house. And Mike Loxley has been um, beating on the drums, you know, trying to, you know, gather and rally support. Um, but, but it's been it's been pretty it's been difficult for him, you know, and we try as alumni to do what we can. But, you know, I think we're in a different era than what I was in because there was no NIL. You know what I mean? There was that, not that added element of um, contention. And, you know. Under under this under different circumstances, Ralph Regions was able to, you know, rally the troops internally. He was able to, you know, rally the fans externally. And um, we were able to do some pretty amazing things. So I think we we have to look at this from an overall standpoint and really ask ask the question, have we been doing everything that we can to make Maryland a power in the power five? I mean, if you look at things logistically, Maryland is in one of the largest media markets. We have some of the most, some of the greatest things to offer as an area. The campus has pretty much been transformed. Um, we should be able to capitalize capitalize off of that on on all fronts. Um, we should be in that conversation with the Michigans, with the Ohio states. You know, we should be in that conversation just because of our our geographic location. You know. Not to mention the amount of talent that's in the state. We should be there, but 
you know, it's, it's, it's been tough. And I know it's been tough for Locks. He's doing the best he can with what he has. Um, and I'm, I'm here to support him in any way, shape or form. I, I want you to understand that, you know, once you're a Terp, you're a Terp for life. Locks lives and bleeds Maryland. He always has. And, you know, we all want to see him succeed the way we know he can. We all want to see Maryland live up to the potential that we know it can. Having been around Loxley as a player, um, what do you imagine he's doing right now as a coach to kind of try to rally the troops? What do you think his message is in the locker room after that game, during practices? And what about Lox being around him as a player? Do you think he can – why do you think he can write this ship and write this season? Well, two things. One of the things, he's being brutally honest. You know, players respect that. He's going to let us let us know exactly where we went wrong. He's also going to let us know the things that, you know, the things that went right. You know, but he's not going to sugarcoat anything. And at the end of the day, um, last Saturday, we, we just weren't good enough. We weren't, we weren't good enough. Do we have the potential? Absolutely we do. But potential means nothing until you go out there and do it. I think that's the general message. The general message is going to be, you know, we're going to have to put on our hard hats, get to work this week, and figure out the way to right this ship. He's going to he's going to show that he has belief in his guys, that he believes that he has the right guys wearing those uniforms and those helmets. But at the end of the day, they've got to go out there and perform just have one more about the current team. Um, you mentioned the fans and kind of needing to be there when it's good and when it's bad. But you know, I was at the game Friday and the, the student section was completely packed. It's been relatively filled. And, you know, I think that there's been games where it has been filled and it's been, you know, very good environments. And Maryland has typically lost those games. So what do you say to fans who feel the kind of frustration of like the same loss is continuously happening for the same reasons? And when I do go, it's I'm not getting, you know, what I'm putting in. I'll put it to you like this. We are all in this together. Win or lose. We're all in this together. You guys wear the colors. You guys wear the logo. The same way we do. We don't we don't have a choice as Terrapins on when we show up and when we don't. Win or lose. These guys are out there. They're not out there trying to lose. Let's be clear. No one's trying to lose. We're all in this to win. In sport, in every game, there's a winner and a loser, right? Some, these past few weeks, it hasn't been going our way. It doesn't mean we don't still need the support because we do. The same way in life when, you know, we fall short. We make mistakes. You still want your supporters to be there for you, to cheer you on, you know, to motivate you. And I, listen, make no mistake, I'm not bashing our fans. I will never do that. That is never going to happen to me. You will never, you will never hear me do that. I'm trying to spark and ignite a flame that resonates because it matters to us as players. When we come out, you know, before kickoff and and we see a packed house. The student section is always lit and live. Make no mistake about it. But the students are not the only fans we have here. The students have consistently poured out and supported us, and we are grateful and thankful to that. But they're not the only ones that come out and support. We need everyone. We need the entire state to be there for us the way the entire state of Michigan is there for Michigan. The way entire, the entire state of Pennsylvania is there for Penn State and Pittsburgh. Whether Penn State wins or loses, when have you seen that place empty or close to empty or even not even have, having a seat not, not sat in? It, it, it doesn't happen because – they're diehard, and I know we have diehards. I know it's tough times. I know, you know, it hasn't gone our way. It doesn't mean we stop. This show doesn't stop. We still need you. We need your support. It is vital and crucial. 
it is what keeps us going. Seems like they uh they might want to hire you to uh, hype up the fans once in a while. Uh, oh, okay. I'm sure that's that's music to the ears of. <laughs> Listen, man, I, I bleed red. You see what I'm wearing today. This wasn't by choice. Like, my closet is full of Maryland stuff because I bleed this. You know what I mean? I sacrificed my body, my life, and my time for this university and for this program, and it doesn't just stop when I lose my eligibility. I'm going to always be this way. I'm going to be that way come Saturday for homecoming. You know what I mean? This is This is what it means, and I think – what I think is the foundation of Maryland football, the building blocks, are those years from 2001 to 2004. If you go back in history, I know a lot of you probably either were, were on bottles or weren't born yet. But the foundation of what we have today is, are those three seasons. Those three seasons, we left the University of Maryland. We left the football program in the best state that it had ever been in. We won, I want to say, 33 games in three years on pace and on par with the Michigans. Not even Michigan because we were better than Michigan. On par with the Miamis, with the Oklahomas. We were there with them. We were the team that blew Tennessee out 30-something to three. We left, we left the, the state of the program where we intended it to be when we all got there in 2000 or 1999. We, we are yearning for those days to come. We know we've got the right captain of the ship. Mike Lockley is the only man for this job. He's the only guy for it. He's built for it. And this is just athletics. It's football. But we also got to take into account the logistics behind it. We also have to take into to account the things that are needed in today's day and age of football and today's day and age of athletics, period. And really do really do a question, a self-assessment on are we doing everything we can as a fan base and as as a as a whole to 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 make certain that we we put out a winner. It's it's not easy. I and I told Locks, I tell Locks all the time. Heavy is the head that wears the crown because the amount of pressure to perform, like most people don't really understand, it's more cutthroat than corporate America. And I've, I've been fortunate enough to succeed at this level and go on to play at the highest level. So I have a little, a little different understanding. I, we all want the same thing, period. We all want the same thing. I wanted to ask you about your experience on that early 2000s roster. Actually, take it back a little bit before then. Um, coming out of high school, you only took two official visits, one of them being Maryland. As um, soon as you committed to Maryland, you had schools knocking on your door, Michigan included, asked you to kind of reconsider that decision. What was it about Maryland that made it so enticing for you as a high schooler to commit there and come to College Park? 100% right, and I'm, I'm finally glad somebody got the story correct. Um, Michigan begged me to, to just take the visit. And I am a man of my word. When I make a commitment, I stick to it. That's number one. Um, number two, when I took my visit, I only took two visits. That was Maryland and Pitt. I was not a guy who liked to travel. I did not, did not like getting on planes. Like, wasn't my deal. Um, when I got here, it felt like home. It felt like home. And, the, and really... The person that made it feel like home was Mike Locksley. He made it feel like home. He was he was upfront and honest. He was recruiting. He had two running backs, myself and Mike Kitchen, um, also from Pennsylvania. Ended up going to Georgia Tech and and being with Ralph Friedman. But he, he was upfront. We're we're only recruiting two, one running back, and it's going to end up being one of you. And my main focus was the fact that I was only two hours away from home, that my parents and my family can come and see me play, that I could play early, which I did. I played as a freshman. And my father envisioned college for me, walking through the gates and being somewhere that I didn't have to leave. And 
That's exactly what happened for the first two and a half years. I never left campus. Didn't even go to Bentley's. You know, I was so locked in. You know, funny story, I didn't go to Bentley's until the end of my junior year. And when I when I got to the doors at Bentley's, somebody grabbed me and said, holy, well, I got to watch what I say here. Um, you don't ever come out. I'm buying everything for you tonight. Man. You know what I mean? <laughs> so, yeah. How was your you time? Know. How, was your, how was your time, man? Oh, Lord. <laughs> we, we can't talk about this on the air, brother. <laughs> <laughs> You're but, the next week homecoming. You got to run it back. <laughs> listen, I'll, I'll probably be at Bentley's for sure. We're talking about right your, your early kind of playing days at Maryland, your time at Maryland. Um, mm-hmm. Talk me through what life was like after, right? You you go to the NFL, you go to the Eagles for two years. Just take me through kind of your, your life and career after that. So, you know, I was actually in Philly for three, three years. My, um, my rookie year, um, we ended up going to the Super Bowl. Um, but before then, you know, I'm sitting in offensive install. And to my right is, is T.O. <laughs> He's laying there with a pillow, about to go to sleep. And to my left is Donovan McNabb. And for around two seconds, I was like, holy smokes. But then I realized I was sitting in the seat. And I belonged. And all that starstruck went out the window and I went to work. I will say I have never been more prepared a day in my life than what I was when I got to the Philadelphia Eagles. Um, Learning Ralph's offense, which is a pro-style offense, Andy Reid's playbook is literally the size of two phone books. And I don't even know if you guys even know what phone books look like. But (laughs) um, very, very large. And I was able to pick up on things that other people couldn't. Guys from the Big Ten at that time um, had a lot of trouble picking up the West Coast offense, and and I didn't. Um, And that's only because Mike Loxley taught me very well on on how to compartmentalize and how to learn. Funny story is, um, my senior year, when Mike Loxley left and went to Florida, um, I I was devastated. I was heartbroken. He'll tell you. Like, I sat there and I cried for about a good 30 minutes. And I left the complex. I went back to my room and Ralph called me back to the office. And, you know, he told me, he said, look, I'm trying to get him back. And I'm like, it's not going to happen. But just know whoever you bring in here is not, they're not going to be able to coach me because I've learned everything that I need to learn. And my next coach was Bill O'Brien. And so I get into the meeting room with Bill O'Brien, you know, Bill has gone on to coach for Tom, coach with Tom Brady and Penn State and the Houston Texans. Um, but that's the first thing Bill O'Brien said to me. There's there's nothing I can teach you. You've been to the top of the mountain. I just need you to be here for the young guys. And that's the culture that we created at Maryland. We never shied away from 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 giving information to the younger guys. It was always a teaching moment. And it started in that running back room. We knew at that time. Wins and losses went through running the ball, went through the running back room. And so we kind of we kind of carried on the legacy and the foundation that was left to us, you know, from the older guys, from Lamont Jordans, from, you know, the Buddy Rogers, um, going all the way back to Charlie Wysocki. You know, I'm, I'm a historian of Maryland football. I know everyone. You know, because I want to be able to pay homage, and I wanted to be able to pay homage to the guys who came before me with my play. You mentioned it. Um, you know, Freegen obviously kind of created that culture, and, and I want to ask you a pretty direct question. How much do you think the firing of Ralph Freegen set back Maryland football? Set us back a decade. Set us back a decade, for sure. You know, a lot of Eagles were involved in that in that, in that that decision. I think the firing of Ralph and the hiring of Edsel set us back a decade. Edsel literally came into a house that Rouse built and tore it apart. He tore all of the history that we created. He tore them all off the walls. 
all of the all academic ACC pictures that were going around in every meeting room, he threw in the trash. He threw everything that had to do with Ralph Region out. And Kevin Glover had to call me, and you can verify this, to come and get some of that, those things. Those are treasures. Those That was history. And I housed some of those things for some of our former players. It set us back a decade. For sure. How much did that frustrate you as an alumni and a former player to see that happen? A, l- a lot of guys did. If it wasn't for Dwight Galt, who was our strength and conditioning coach, ended up going to Penn State with, with Franklin, with James. It was, if it wasn't for him, nobody would have come back. Because of the state that Maryland football was left in under Edsel. Um, he, he really gutted. Uh, something that was built. He, he he tore it apart. And it made a lot of guys wary on on even um, contributing and coming back, like myself included. You know, there was no one that we recognized at the University of Maryland and, and, and in our football complex. It was almost like, you know, there was an imposter, somebody imposing the greatest coach that Maryland history that Maryland has ever seen. No, I think that's important to bring up. And I think that's the question I think Maryland fans kind of ponder. Yeah, it's, it's, it's set, it set us back a decade for sure. Yeah. And I want to kind of, as we, when you talk about um, Ralph and yours relationship, I know you told me that you know, he's not necessarily, wasn't necessarily the most emotional guy um, when he was coaching and, and you guys have kind of created that bond now, but, when you were going through those injuries, and I can just imagine you get to kind of a place as a player where, um, especially in the early 2000s, that wasn't necessarily the coach-player relationship with with most coaches, right, is kind of that emotional um, aspect to it. Mm-hmm. Do you think that um, if the, if your injuries had happened now, like how do you think it would have changed how you handled it or, or how you went about it? Um, different, different area, different era, different time. Um, There's a lot more um, at these guys' disposal from a mental health standpoint. Mental health was not a primary focus back then. Um, There's a lot of changes that have gone in time. You know, how? how, remember, I went through two-a-days. These guys do not. Um, There are a lot of time restrictions that come into play in today's game. Um, and it is, it is definitely different. It definitely, um, it definitely, I, I almost beg to say, you know, they're not really built the way we were built where we were a little tougher. We had to deal with a little bit more of adversity. Um, we were allowed to be coached harder and it, allowed you to develop thick skin. And I say this often. Um, if I could deal with Ralph Friedgen, I can deal with anyone. And I understand now as a man what he was doing and his style of motivation for me. Now, let make no mistake, his style wasn't that way with everyone, you know, but he knew what would motivate me. He knew that lighting a fire up in up under my belly would would be to question me and and I was always hell bent on proving people wrong so you know that kind of style of coaching is a little extinct at this point in time um but make no mistake if I would have had the amount of resources that are available now you know, we could be talking about a, a completely different narrative. First, I got one more for you, and you kind of go through it from an athlete's perspective, um, the in, the amount of injuries you did mm-hmm. after such a high sophomore season. Now, you know, 20 years, 15 years later, um, how do you handle maybe that feeling of kind of lost potential, or or what do you go through with your in your mind, and, and how was that growth for you to kind of coming to accept the fact that, you know, things just didn't shape out for whatever reason. And it, I mean, you obviously had success, but the ways that it could have looked like it would have been, you know, after mm-hmm. your sophomore season. You know, I'm a firm believer that things happen for a reason. Um, and if you know me and you know this about me, even to this day, 
The only thing that matters to me is the guys that suited up with me, they'll tell you they will want nobody else dotting that I but me. That amount, that amount of respect, that amount of admiration, even to this day, um, you never know what your journey does for other people. You never know how you impact other people and how you handle adversity. And I'm finding out now, 20 years later, that my teammates looked up to me in ways that I never thought they, they did because of the things that I was able to endure because of what they watched me go through, how they watched me fight, and how they watched me never quit. You know? So that alone is what helps me sleep at night and puts a smile on my face. To know that the guys that I battled with, they would rather have nobody else but me. I think that's a pretty powerful thing, man. And and we appreciate you sharing some of that and, and sharing the stories you did. Um, I appreciate this time. I appreciate you allowing me to tell a little bit of my story and give people a little bit more insight into mm -hmm. Bruce Perry. You know, I, we sat, we all sacrifice a lot for this university. We all sacrifice a lot for the opportunity to wear, to wear the, the red, black and yellow and white. We all, we all sacrifice a lot. And, and to be able to tell a piece of my story that, that not a lot of people know, um, there's all there's so many things you don't know. Like, I think I may have about 16 records in the record books. Like, these are things that I'm just finding out to this day because it didn't, it wasn't important to me. I wasn't that type of guy. You know, what was important to me was the product that I put out on the field. And guys knowing that I was willing to go out on my shield for them. So I appreciate you guys giving me the platform. That was about probably the best and most positive you'll hear about Maryland football right now, guys. And, and we don't have to sugarcoat it. Let's just get right into it. Um, Maryland played probably the worst game of the Mike Loxley era. If not, you know, probably definitely top three. Um, just a, a brutal game, a 37-10 to 10 loss at home as 10.5-point favorites. They lose to the Wildcats, who were winless in Big Ten play. Um, there's a lot of ingredients to this one. Uh, Brendan, I'll kind of let you start. When you look at a game like this, um, how crippling is this not only to this season, but just kind of the program's image as a whole? It's more crippling to the season than it is to the image as a whole. I, I don't think it takes that big of a hit to the image as a whole. I know there are a lot of angry fans right now after the 0-3 start in Big Ten play, but it makes this season a failure because the odds that Maryland makes the bowl ga a bowl game now are really, really low. And that's kind of what's been the measure of success in the past three or four years under Mike Loxley. We're well aware this team is not going to win a Big Ten championship. But if they can win a bowl game or go to a bowl game, that's a successful season. And, you know, it's, it's likely looking like that's not going to happen. Maryland causes four turnovers against Indiana. Maryland creates four turnovers, you know, has four turnovers against Northwestern. It doesn't matter how you cut it. They lost the game. Uh, very ugly game. And I think the turnovers were kind of the story of the game in a sense that Maryland just could not do anything right. Whenever they, you know, maybe, you know, you, you would think if Maryland puts on a really good drive here, they're back in this game. Every time you felt that way, a turnover happened. And, you know, unlike Maryland in the Indiana game, Northwestern capitalized off those turnovers. And so, I don't know. It, it, it's a it's a bad it's a bad look at, at the moment, Mike. What'd you say? Definitely a bad look. Definitely a bad look on Lox's part too. Be the first game that he takes over the offensive play calling for the team, and they turn out their worst offensive performance of the season. Billy has his worst completion percentage. They score their lowest amount of points yet this season. Definitely a bad look on Lox, but. I know what's coming. I am going to play the devil's advocate here. I don't think one game should alter how the fan base views Loxley. I know there's a lot of people saying the seat is hotter now, Loxley's job. Maybe there should be questions surrounding it. I don't agree with any of that at all. And I want to talk about where Maryland was before Loxley came in. Those eight years before Loxley came in, after they fired Ralph Regan, they had a 38-61 and 61 record, a 38% win percentage, and were even worse in conference play. They were 19-48 and 48 for a 28% win percentage. They had just two winning seasons, had only three bowl game appearances. Not that they were major bowl games at all, but they lost those anyways. 
Now Maryland is coming off back-to-back eight and five seasons, three straight bowl game wins. They're 31 and 31 under locks after Friday's loss, which to be at 500 after the past eight years before mid. locks, I don't it's think exactly that's mid. The, I don't think that's the biggest issue of all. all and right. look, they, the team is struggling in a year that we knew was going to be a rebuilding season, anyways. After Talia left, and then look at who they got coming in. They got six four stars coming in next season. One of the most hyped QB prospects for Maryland history coming in with Malik Washington. And all those guys are continuously reaffirming their commitment on social media. You know, I just don't see how somebody could say this team could be doing better with someone other than Locks. Is Maryland a top destination for coaches? No. So what's going to happen when Loxley, a Maryland homegrown guy, a turf, an esteemed coach himself after winning assistant of the year of Alabama, is gone? What's going to happen? You know, I don't think there's many replacements who can thrive and build the culture the way Loxley has the past few years. So Michael had made a lot of points there. Some I agree with, some I disagree with. I'll start with the latter. Um, I think saying the history of Maryland football is incredibly important, right? Everything comes with context. When we discuss these, uh, we tend to be, you know, we're in the in- industry of reactionary takes, right? A team loses a game. You know, coaches can't perform. They win a big game. Everything's great. And so I think adding that sort of historical element is important. On the other hand, I do think that the reasoning for saying Maryland can't do better or that they're, you know, low look, we've had a bad history and now Loxley's doing, you know, solid to to okay, we can't get any better. I just don't think that that's the case. I think if you look across college football, there are plenty of examples of teams who have hired coaches that are doing very well comparatively to their um, their history. I mean, take a look at the teams Maryland lost to this year. Indiana. Can anybody tell me a single thing about Indiana's football tradition? They have way worse of a football history than Maryland, and very comparatively as a basketball school that has had a mediocre football program for years. Kurt Signetti has that team 6-0 and and ranked, something that Mike Loxley has never done. Jonathan Smith comes to Michigan State. Obviously, Michigan State had a you know a more story history, but when you look at them, talk about Mark D'Antonio. He came to a program that had absolutely nothing and got them to a college football playoff berth. So I think that when we talk about these things, yes, it's important to mention the historical contest. Yes, it's important to bring up that Loxley took over a dumpster fire. But it's also important to remember that there is always a coach out there who could potentially be doing better than what you have. Lance Leipold at Kansas. These are all points that I think fans bring up and I think are completely valid. The fact that Maryland has lost three games this season to essentially three first-year head coach. David Braun was hired last year, but he was an interim. I mean, I had this stat. I tweeted it out. The coaches that Loxley has lost to has a combined coaching experience of, I think, around uh, 31 games. 31 games. Loxley's coached 68. At this point, and they're losing the games the same way every time. Poor offensive line play. We knew that would be an issue. They didn't do enough to address it. A bad secondary that they continuously call man-to-man coverage that can't cover in man-to-man. And an offense that, like Mike said, Loxley took over at play calling and they had their worst output of the season. I think that this season completely falls. Yes, we can talk about a transition season. And yes, you can talk about next year's class coming in. The fact that you're three and three in three games, you know, Indiana, fine. We can say that should have been a loss. Two games at home when you're double digit favorites, there is no excuses to lose those games. I don't care if, oh, wait, Talia Tugavaloa left this season. You replaced him with one of the better quarterbacks in the Big Ten. It's year six now. Loxley has, quote, his guys. This has been three recruiting classes now that have been here for four years. There's nothing to say about, oh, we need more time. Oh, let's wait for the next class. The next class has been your seventh class now. So eventually, I do think, I don't think that the calls for him to get fired, it's not happening. A, the buyout is is too um, too steep. B, he deserves some um, a, a way more leeway than some fans are giving him. He will not be fired this season. He will likely not be fired next season. But I do think that there needs to start being serious questions about what Mike Loxley's ceiling is and what he's actually bringing to this program as head coach and if Maryland could upgrade. And I do think that those are questions that need to be considered. And definitely, it's not our place to tell fans to, oh, well, it's not happening, so don't even talk about it. You make some very interesting points there. Uh, I don't know. I maybe should have started us off, but I think 
I kind of disagree with you in the sense that like, I don't even think it's a conversation worth having. Pretty much we know he's not going to get fired. Uh, you make a lot of valid points about other head coaches at other schools, you know, coming in and being very successful, but the money, they're not going to buy him out, A, and B, the recruiting class next year is just way too good. If Loxley leaves, all those kids are gone, and the program is even worse. So if you really think about it, the chances that they would ever get rid of Loxley are so low. It's pretty much not a conversation worth having. Do fans have valid points? Absolutely. But at the end of the day, it's it's not going to happen. It's all, it's all just banter if people want to talk. And also, let's push back. Like, this recruiting class, yes, it is good. It is not so much better than what they've been pulling in. They just have a quarterback. That that's that's what it is. It's Malik, and then it's around what Maryland's pulled in. Okay, absolutely. So, but if if Loxy's gone, you have none of that, and yeah. the program is is so much worse. Definitely. But Malik could transfer next year. Like, absolutely. I mean, or you know, you can look at the other side of the coin. And you coin, and you get someone like Kurt Signetti, who comes from a you know not a power five school. Someone has a very successful season and brings whatever fifteen or sixteen of their guys. I don't know. It's, it's, it's an interesting point, but at the end of the day, it's really not going to happen. The thing that I want to talk about is how is Mike Loxley so bad after a bye week? Maryland has another bye week this season. That's automatically a loss. I mean, yeah, it's at Oregon, so it's already automatically a loss. But I don't understand how you can be so terrible after not playing a game the previous week. Sam, you're covering the team. Do you have an answer for this? Um. I don't. And it's not just losses, guys. They're losing by an average margin of double digits, considerably amount of double digits. Um, Ten point favorites, too. That goes against everything I've ever known against a bye week ever. And I think it I mean, I'm not trying. I think it points to coaching, too. I mean, eventually something becomes a trend, right? You're 0 seven and we're not saying 0 seven against Michigan every year. You just play Northwestern. OK, who was Owen Owen two in Big Ten play had scored five points in their last Big Ten game and had a quarterback who was the backup to start the year. You have now lost seven games as a bi- after the bye week. You can talk about feeling prepared and all of this, but eventually results speak for itself. Maryland was unprepared to play on Friday night. It, it looked like it, and it showed. Their offensive line wasn't picking up stunts. Their defense, again, could not defend the pass. Northwestern had, I think, I, I did the I can't remember the tweet, but basically they had four to five explosive pl- passing plays on the season. They got three in the first half. And it it just there's issues with this roster, right? Like Mike said, there's no question that this roster is not built to win, you know, nine games in the Big Ten. I think we completely overstepped. You know, you look at some of these transfers they added, they haven't panned out. The offensive line has been atrocious. Um so the roster clearly isn't talented enough, but they're talented enough to beat Northwestern, okay? And to not come out of a bye week when your season is essentially on the line, to not come out ready to go in front of a pa- packed, you know, for CQ Stadium packed on a Friday night, there's no excuses. It's it's It was coaching, I don't want to say malpractice, but it was a coaching blunder. So I guess now turning the page to this upcoming weekend, USC seven-point favorites right now the last time I checked. I, I have to say something about that. That line could not make less sense. I couldn't disagree with that line more. You're telling me the people that are making these lines think that USC is 20 points, and I say that again, 20 points worse than Northwestern? That's what that line says, that they think that USC is – I know that's not how lines really work, but they think that USC is 20 points worse than Northwestern? What am I missing here? That line makes absolutely no sense. I think it should be probably 21 points. I understand it's a homecoming. I understand – USC has lost two games in a row. USC just lost to the fourth best team in the country in overtime. USC is a good yeah. football team. They have a loss at the Big House. They lost the game to Minnesota, and they have three losses on the road in the Big Ten, and they're from California. I, so, I guess they lost, is, not on the road. Their, their last loss was at Penn yeah. State, but they have three losses in the Big Ten to solid teams. This is a yeah. terrible matchup for Maryland, too. What does USC oh. do better than any team in the cut, <laughs> Big Ten? Explosive, explosive passing plays. What does Maryland do worse than any team in the Big Ten? Allow wow, explosive passes. <laughs> like, you could make a lot of money betting against Maryland this season, and I I completely agree with Brennan. I think seven and a half is way too low. I think twenty is probably a little much. I'd say fourteen and a half to seventeen, but it it's gonna take a, a and and oh like we can point to the history of Maryland playing well in big games and, and upsets, right? Like I guess they've you know hung with Ohio State, but I mean. It just doesn't feel like 
I mean, they could pull off a miracle. I'm not trying to – the offense could yeah. hang. Billy could play really well, but I just don't – I don't see it. I mean, yeah, you're right. Maryland plays one game a year where they're very close against a team they should not be very close to. Freshman year, it was Ohio State at home. Last year, or our sophomore year, whatever, one year ago, it was Michigan at home. Will that happen this weekend? I just don't think so. Those Maryland teams are also better than this team. They right? have a they have a professional quarterback. What well, league? I don't care. Professional yeah, quarterback. Yeah, you know can we can we okay, this is the last question I want to ask. Can we put <laughs> about Billy? Like let's talk about Billy because I pers I, I want to hear your thoughts before I where do we think Billy ranks on the issues with this team? Like if you had to kind of delegate the responsibility of why they're three and three, where would quarterback kind of sit? I don't know because Talia does not win that game against Northwestern because he's not the one fumbling the ball. And he's not, I mean, he sure he was known to have some fumble sixes and, and that was a bad play by Billy. Is that play really his fault? Probably not. I mean, you're going to hold onto the ball getting blindsided. Yeah. You're taught to tuck it, but like that is really not his fault. Billy Edwards it definitely ranks, you know, under a lot of other problems with this team, defensive pass coverage is probably the, the biggest issue. Uh, I would say it's probably not in the top five of issues on this team. Sure, if they had, I don't know, the best quarterback in the country, is this team different? Of course, but right. they have a lot of other issues to solve. And the first two are penalties and just holding on to the ball. Michael, I'll phrase it to you differently. If Talia Tugavaloa was this team's quarterback, what would their record be? I hate to say it, but they probably lose that Northwestern game as well. I mean, Talia lost at Northwestern last year. Um, Indiana, with the defensive performance they had that game, they probably lose that one too. Michigan State's probably the only one I could say maybe it sways differently. But look, no, played, really Michigan State good. is definitely a win. Yeah. Definitely a if, win. You, if you told me at the beginning of the year that through six games, Billy Edwards would have thrown 11 touchdowns, only three interceptions, and tossed for 1,700 yards, I would have said, okay, Maryland probably started 5-1, and 6-0. Yeah. Oh, this is the type of start that we were imagining. 100%. It's not the case at all. Yeah, I mean, the <laughs> offensive line, I think, has got to be uh, – like. They have not done a good enough job. So maybe Talia kind of reduces that, right? Because he's more of a, a mobile player. But but Talia, Talia can't play cornerback. So it doesn't really solve the issue at all. He can't, so. he can't catch the ball either. Like it's, <laughs> and they cannot there's a reason run. there's 11 people on the field. We talked about the running game. They cannot run the football. Like point blank period. They have they have one good running game. They cannot block. Unless the referee is helping them block, in which case they're very good. <laughs> this is true. Um but yes, I don't think I think Billy is nowhere near this team's biggest issues. I actually think Billy's been way better than I even expected. Um, throwing the ball, uh, I there's a lot of problems with Maryland uh, Maryland football before you get to the quarterback. So um, I would USC is going to be a tough game. I I don't know, guys. I probably see this one. Maybe they hang around just going off the energy of the homecoming crowd, and then it just kind of falls apart in the second half. That would be my I mean, guess. That's, yeah. USC's also got to be pissed. Yeah. I mean, this, I this team, if you look at the rest of their schedule, they can probably they could have – they're not going to. They could have probably made the college football playoff if they beat Penn State and they win that Minnesota game. The loss to Michigan doesn't really matter. It's a loss at Michigan. This team is fired up. You know, the joke I made on Twitter is that Maryland is a three and three Big Ten team, and USC is a three and three Big Ten team, but they are damn sure not equals. Because yeah, if you watch the game on Saturday, you're going to see why why that's a funny joke. This is a pissed off team. They've lost three of their last four. They are way better than their record says. I can't see them losing to Maryland. I would bet whatever Miller Moss is over passing yards. I would. Can I do that for my best bet as a prop bet? <laughs> uh, I, I will of, actually completely allow that. Yep. Because <laughs> that's what I would imagine. And um, I would I would guess the Trojans head out west uh, feeling feeling pretty good. Um, the team that went out west and came back to College Park feeling very happy was the Maryland men's soccer team. So we got something positive to talk about, guys, on the pitch with both teams. But let's start with the men's. Um, went to Washington and a nice win. Again, this team, guys, they're just – they're winning close games, something they didn't do last year. Um, they could not win in Big Ten in one goal in one goal games, um, but they beat Washington three to two. Uh, they're winning these these kind of tight games that, you know, I think that's a sign of uh, a team that that knows what they're doing. So, uh, Brendan, take us through the Washington win and what you're seeing from from Sasha's team here as we're kind of getting into the the sludge of Big Ten play. 
yeah, this episode will come out after the newest uh, rankings, but they're probably going to be in the top eight, maybe. I mean, I guess maybe they could chop the crack the top five or six, but that Washington game showed resilience. They went down one nothing. They tied it up. They went down two to one. They tied it up, and both those goals to tie the game up came five or six within the five minute mark of the previous goal happening. You know, they responded quickly. They brought the momentum, and of course, you probably know who I'm going to say scored the game winning goal. Colin Griffith. He has been doing absolutely everything for this Maryland team. And I mean, he might be the best player in the Big Ten, at least the best forward in the Big Ten. The way he's just, whenever this team needs a spark, whenever this team needs a goal, he's been there. And it's been so impressive to watch. And it's kind of like clockwork. You know, Maryland needs a game winning goal. All right, here comes a Colin Griffith header. So super impressive. Uh, This team controls their own destiny to win the Big Ten regular season, something I did not think. If you look at the first couple games of the season, they tied at UMBC. They lost to Georgetown. You know, two of those first three games, you're like, oh boy, here we go again. Another team that cannot score. And then they turned it around. Colin Griffith has been a huge part of that. Leon Cool has been a huge part of that, taking penalty kicks. And they have a very strong offensive attack. And the defense has been pretty dang good too. So, you know, this is probably the team that, that could go the farthest of all the Maryland teams. Field hockey obviously has a very good chance as well. But men's soccer team mm-hmm. has been the team to watch. The George Mason game will happen after this recording comes out, but that's also a really important game. Not for the Big Ten, though. So, you know, if Maryland wins that game, they'll probably move up in the rankings. But for standings-wise, it doesn't matter. So we'll see if they get ready to play that game. And then they'll play UCLA on Monday. That's another big game and another three points that Maryland would love to have. And, you know, they only have four Big Ten games to go. So every time they can get closer and get get a couple more points, uh, the closer they get to winning that Big Ten. But that's probably enough about men's soccer Women's soccer won? Is that true? What? That oh. is true. This is uh, monumental for them. So second game with interim head coach after they fired coach Megan Ryan Nemzer. Last Thursday, Maryland defeats Nebraska. They didn't just score one goal. They scored two goals. Their first two goals in Big Ten play since October 23rd, 2022. It was also their first home Big Ten win since September 16th. 2022 first overall win and goal in over a month and then obviously first win for interim head coach Michael Marciano Brendan kind of what did you see happen well before I get into that I want to mention the fact that they fire sorry they not didn't fire that's not the correct language they I parted ways they parted, they ways. parted ways with Megan Ryan Nemzer, uh which was I think you know with within eight or nine hours before they had a game that night they played Penn State at home on Thursday night that game was ugly. They actually almost scored. They were so close to scoring a goal on a corner kick. Um, you know, in the first 15 minutes of that game, that would have been ridiculous. Uh, and I kind of thought it was going to be, you know, one of those storybook things. Coach leaves and then interim coach, you know, fires the group up. They lost 5 nothing to Penn State. That game was uh, ugly. But they come back against Nebraska, who's a significantly worse team than Penn State. And they score a goal. Delaney DiMartino gets the first Big Ten goal in 700-something days. And then... That's a goal that's going to probably uh, not change the program, but have a huge impact on the rest of the season and just the morale of that team. Obviously, the morale was low before uh, you know they changed coaches. Uh, and they played the rest of that game pretty uh, tactically to hold on for the win. They got another goal around the 70th minute. Um, one of Nebraska's players got two yellow cards, so Maryland was playing a, a woman up for uh, a good bit of the second half. And hey, they got the win. Scoring is one thing, right? Like, it was remarkable this team had not scored, but getting the win is also a, a big feat there. So um, kudos to them. Kudos to interim coach uh, Michael Marciano. And hey, if I had to make a prediction, I would say he's probably going to be the next head coach. My guess is that that is what will happen. But, you know, Damon Evans said they're going to do a search. So they'll obviously do that. But if you look at his career, it's kind of odd that, you know, he was a head coach of the Drexel program, uh, the men's program. It was kind of odd that he ended up leaving there after two or two or three successful seasons. So he's probably the one in line to be the next head coach of this team. And uh, you should go read up on his bio because he's been pretty dang good at taking teams that were unsuccessful, making them competitive. And that's exactly what this Maryland women's team did. And, uh, you know, you got to give them their uh, got to give them their kudos because they, they were able to get it done. So uh, pretty surprising. I did not know if we were going to see that this year. Sam, thoughts on uh, women's soccer changes? Yeah, I think that um, when you look at this team, obviously – uh, two goals. I think the first game you just kind of have to throw out, right? Like your coach gets fired the day of a game. Um, but this this is really just I. It uh, 
a, a great effort. <laughs> I, I, I'm kind of lost for words because they haven't won in so long that like I'm not used to, to talking positively. But, um, you know, the, the three days after they part with her, they score their first conference goal in over 700 days. Um, over 1,500 minutes of game played. Yeah. And, uh, you know, after you get a penalty and then, um, you know, you score your goal. I, I think that that's kind of what this team has to do. You have to take advantage of opportunities. Obviously, this the storybook, you know, this team isn't going to win the Big Ten, guys. They're not going to, you know, change uh, into something that, that they're not. But um, I do think that clearly you have um, you have something here uh, with, the, with the interim head coach. Um, but you have three regular season games. Let's see what you can do. You win another game. You probably, you know, you win two games. You're definitely hiring the interim head coach. Um, you win one, it's probably right there. So uh, this team's going to have, uh, have opportunities to kind of swing their skis and, and swing the program. So it'll be, it'll be fun to watch here, uh, over the next couple, couple weeks. Um, they're kind of, uh, hanging on here at the end of their, uh, end of their season, but, um, volleyball is also in a tough spot. Uh, they dropped another, um, another two big 10 games wasn't particularly close lost in three sets in both to you know two of the premier programs in the big 10 minnesota and wisconsin um, we don't have to spend much time on this but uh, i do think that this team like when you read obviously anastasia russ you know they they bring back some some talented players but it it's tough in the big 10 and it's also just tough to you know once you get going like it it's hard to to kind of break out of that slump um you know you face two top 15 teams uh, and it, it it didn't really it never got going. Um, you know Sam Sire, who who we know is is one of this team's best players. Um, you know against Wisconsin hit at a point zero four three uh, a rate according to the Diamondback for kills. Um, you know it, it it's tough. Uh, so after beating Minnesota last year to drop drop this one in three sets, I think that um, you're probably looking at. You know, another another poor Big Ten finish uh, for the volleyball team. Um, and they can have... I get a can I get a hot seat uh, meter on Adam Hughes, <laughs> whose contract takes him through the twenty twenty seven season? But Adam Hughes um, will coach out that contract. <laughs> you think he will? Because it's the same non conference, you know, out of conference yeah, type I of mean, thing we've seen with women's soccer. So maybe they'll fire him on the day yeah. of a game. I don't know. This might be they a call... completely unrelated thought, but. You know, it'd be so interesting in college sports to see how many of the games that get scheduled under head coaches, you know, because non-conference games get scheduled years in advance. How many of those coaches actually get to play the games that they scheduled non-conference? Next deep dive at Under the Shelf. I mean, we got it. We got to talk to Derek Willis, throw that thing yeah. in our studio. But uh, uh, that's just like a question that I always think about, like, especially in football yeah. too, like in basketball, the coaches move, move around all the time. And once those games are scheduled, it's really hard to get out of them. So um, yeah. whatever. But yeah, the Minnesota loss in Wisconsin, Minnesota's on the road. That I mean... Yeah, they beat them last year, but those games were Maryland was probably never going to win, uh, even if they played a perfect game. I mean, the Big Ten schedule, as we know, is the absolute gauntlet in terms of volleyball. So it's going to be tough. They have a home game on Friday against USC, uh, an away game on Sunday. I would expect them to go one and one this weekend, but it's a long season for the volleyball team, so it's still early in Big Ten play. Uh, but it ha- hasn't been that, that great of a start. Uh, the team that is the highest ranked currently at Maryland, field hockey. Mike, what's been going on? Yeah, recording this Monday night, they just defeated American 4-1, to one, and they have a gauntlet of a schedule to finish out the year. Four out of their five last opponents to close out this stretch are going to be ranked opponents. They're 4-3 and three in such games so far, and it's going to get started this week. They got Michigan and Ohio State, both critical games for the Terps. Michigan right now is 3-0 and in Big Ten play, in second place ahead of Maryland, while Ohio State is 2-1 and one in fourth place right behind Maryland. So the Terps kind of have a chance this week to get out of that sandwich and get ahead of both. Um, so we'll see if Missy Maharg and her squad will do that. Yeah, um, obviously this team has got some talent. I Two more freshmen. Uh, I read a, read an article about, I'm not even going to try to pronounce, Anamine Jean clean, Cleanhout. I'm really sorry if I mispronounced that. Not if, that I did mispronounce that. And Ella, Ella Gaten, um, both play significant roles start for this team. They're the only freshmen to start. Kind of like Hope Rose. She started her freshman year, I believe. She did. Um, 
So maybe following in the footsteps of the program there. Um, but the, the field hockey team, as we always say, I feel like gauntlet of a schedule. <laughs> They're, they are one team that will play a, a, a tough slate. Um, tough slate. And they win, and they win their, their conference. Yeah. We games. might, we might just have to stop apart. saying that because like, we just know the Big Ten is good at every sport. And yeah. Maryland's usually yeah. not in yeah. some of the Olympic sports are that mm-hmm. great. So. <laughs> we, said, we said tough slate for the field hockey team. Uh, I'm going to make a corny joke here and say it's been a tough slate for me and Brendan in these picks. Um, it, oh, nothing, my God. Nothing I mean, if, you, if, if, if someone out there is listening to this podcast and wants to make some money, You'd be pretty successful if you went against me the whole season. So I don't know. I don't know what that means, but yeah. And and Brendan will start it this week. So just mute your earbuds, and then you can kind of get back into and it. You can uh, go pick the opposite stuff. Yeah. Uh, if you're doing that, please gamble responsibly. Uh, so yeah, I'll start. I am minus six and a half against Michigan State. Uh, I got all my picks in the Big Ten this weekend. You know, it's the league I know the best, but don't it ex- probably means don't explain just. Just say your picks. We all know they're going to be wrong. All right, my bad. All right, here I go. Nebraska six and a half against Indiana, and the Boilermakers of Purdue plus twenty seven and a half against Oregon. Sam doesn't like that pick. I like that pick. That means it's probably a bad pick. I'll pass it off to Sam. I I think I would have chosen the opposite of all three of those games, but uh, I'm going to do a lot of big games this week. I'm going to start it with the with the game of the week. I think not. I think I know Texas minus three and a half against Georgia. That one is going to be a lot of fun to watch. We said U.S. Uh, Ohio State Oregon would be great. I think this one might be even better, um, as long as you know Texas as a quarterback doesn't slide with two seconds left. Um, then I'm going to follow it up with Utah minus four and a half against TCU. I TCU just I, I saw that line and I trust Utah way more than the Horn Frogs. And then I'm going to finish it with Tennessee minus three against Bama, going against our picks leader. That flows right into Michaels. Yes, so I went 2-1 and one the past week. I don't know what the overall record is right now, but I know it's better than those two. So we're going to start with USC favored by seven points at Maryland. I think the Trojans are going to have a good day at SAQ Stadium. Missouri favored by four and a half points versus Auburn. And then Alabama favored by three points at Tennessee. I really think the Crimson Tide are going to have a bounce back week after two really bad weeks against South Carolina and, of course, uh, Vanderbilt. Well- you guys don't not good at picks, but he is good at terrific turf. So no, no crazy intro needed this week. Go ahead, B. Sources are saying I'm undefeated at terrific turf, but I am defeated at picks. Let's do it. They say a program can only go as far as it supports that, and that is definitely true about athletic trainers. Sandy Worth served as the head athletic trainer for the football team from 1992 to 2004. Back in the 1990s, it was very rare for a woman to be the head athletic trainer for a team. In fact. Worth was the first female to serve as the head athletic trainer in the ACC and the only one to serve that position for a football team in the ACC. She dedicated her life to helping athletes at the University of Maryland. She was associated with the athletic department since 1973 after she graduated from the university, all the way until she retired in 2020. She worked with many different programs, including the women's basketball, lacrosse, and field hockey teams. As a part of these teams, she won countless ACC and Big Ten championships, as well as a good number of NCAA championships. She also served as a trainer for the U.S. women's lax and field hockey programs, worth dedicated over 45 years of her life to serving the medical needs of student athletes. And that makes her this week's terrific Terp. Full circle to our guy, Tyler Cronin. Shout out our trainers. Um, and shout out you for listening to this episode. We appreciate your time. Sorry, it's it's a tough time in Maryland sports right now, but we're going to bring you the honest and the good coverage that, that all you fans deserve. So you can find us at Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, uh, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, all the places you get your feeds. Um, keep listening. We really appreciate it, and have a good rest of your night. Guess what? You've got Under the Shell Podcast. Nobody does it better.